We now have um, just over half an hour left to uh, discuss finance for a green future. Um, very much have the floor open to you to, um, to pose questions and taking questions too from the online audience, of which I have a, a slew here already. But let me just introduce the slightly uh, amended panel. Um, it's with, I, I think it's with really considerable delight that I sit here chairing a panel of, I think, global luminaries on climate finance. Um, really great to see, see this panel together. And so to my right, you now have uh, uh, Sheila Whitley, a uh, fellow at, here at ODI and the author of the subsidies report that you see outside and, uh, and one of the architects of the game and, 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 that, and also to um, Smita Nakuda, who leads ODI's work on uh, climate finance. Um, so uh, let me just, as by way of kind of kick off of introduction, ask uh, Sheila and, and Smita by way of introduction to give some headlines from, from their work in this kind of troika of, of ODI reports leading up to Warsaw. Um, Sheila, we've heard some of the messages already about the, the subsidies report, but um, maybe just tell us, what the, what's the kind of climate change impact of fossil fuel subsidies mm -hmm. at the moment? How important actually is it? Well, and, uh, is this working? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, what is, I think, quite important is that work's been done by the IEA that touches on this very specific question about what do we do between now and 2020. So we'll have, we hope for an agreement in 2015 that will be effective from 2020, but we know that there's a lot that has to be done in the interim. And the IEA has put out a report that recommends four policies to keep us on track to two degrees by 2020. Um, those policies are around efficiency in coal-fired power generation, in terms of capturing gas um, from flaring, in terms of efficiency in transport and buildings, and the last policy that they're recommending is phasing out fossil fuel subsidies to consumers by 2020. And they're saying that if that, that happens, we're able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 360 million tons, which is equivalent to the annual emissions of France. So there's quite a significant mm -hmm. emission reduction that can happen just by phasing out fossil fuel subsidies to consumers, let alone those to producers. Okay, thank you. And um, and so, you know, we've got a we've got a you know a, a view on the scale of climate finance. How does that stack up when you measure it against fossil fuel subsidies? Well, what we've found um, from our research, and that actually builds on work that Smita's team has done, and the the website that they have, which is Climate Funds Update, which is doing a lot of great work to track climate finance, is that currently um, those emitters that you described a little bit um, in the panel previously, so the top rich country um, emitters, the 11 countries, what we find is that they are providing seven times more in domestic fossil fuel subsidies than they are in climate finance for developing countries. So it's quite significant, given it's not necessarily the case that you can directly transfer that one budget line item to something else, but it's something that's very worth taking into account when you're thinking about opportunities and sources for climate finance. Mm. Smita might have some other thoughts on that. Let me just, you know, I saw the, the, the statistics in the report about countries spending twice as much on fossil fuel subsidies as they do on healthcare. Is that right? Yes. So there are certain countries who are spending um, more of their budget, their public budget, um, on um, fossil fuel subsidies than on health care, also um, much more than on education in some cases. And in some cases, the public deficits of countries um, mm -hmm. are actually uh, lower than the subsidy bill that these countries have. <coughs> okay. Wow. Okay. So that's, that's subsidies, and very much welcome question on subsidies. And um, Smita, we're about to release a whole group of reports about the fast start funding period on climate finance and kind of where next on climate finance. Uh, tell me, what did we achieve with that $30 billion? You know, it sounds like a lot, of, a lot of money, but actually, what did we buy with it? So just sort of as a, as a bit of a step back, one of the more concrete commitments that countries made when they met in Copenhagen to agree on the contours of, of a more ambitious approach to climate change was around climate finance. So they committed that between 2010 and 2012, they would deliver finance approaching $30 billion um, and that they would try and have that funding be new and additional, and in, in particular that it would focus on increasing funding for adaptation, which historically has been underfunded. Um, most of the money that we spent in developing countries on climate change has been to reduce emissions, but as, as Tom has noted, um, as we feel the impacts of climate change ever more pressingly in developing countries, there was a recognized need to have more support to particularly poor and vulnerable countries to respond to the impacts of, of climate change. 
Um, and, and as noted, my colleagues at the World Resources Institute um, and the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies in Japan and, and ourselves at ODI have just finished a big look at the ways in which this, this funding was delivered during the Fast Art Finance period. And what we find is, on the top line, a very encouraging message in the sense that countries actually exceeded um, their commitment to deliver fast out finance, and their self-reporting suggests that actually as much as $35 billion in public finance was delivered during that, that period. Um, but that number has to be read with the caveat that it's very unclear that all of that funding um, was necessarily additional. And in particular, I think what the fast out finance period has revealed is that different forms of finance provide very different forms of uh, very different functions in recipient countries. And countries have counted very different forms of public finance as fast out finance. Um, so over the period, you've seen a number two of the largest contributors of, of, of finance, the US and Japan, um, also include a substantial share of non-concessional and um, climate finance public finance as as part of as part of this support um, as well as having um, a, a very large share of, of, of loan finance um, involved now there is clearly a need for a diversity of forms of finance if what we want to do is achieve the underlying objective which is around shifting investment towards climate compatible trajectories away from business as usual um, but if that's our end goal, then we need to think about the particular role that finance committed under the convention can play in terms of setting that enabling underlying set of signals that allow those wider flows of funding to be redirected. And different forms of public finance can help us do that sort of capital, <coughs> uh, embrace that capital steerage channel challenge in different ways. Um, and it's, un it's so I think that's part of the big challenge sort of going forward as we think about long-term finances. How do we think about the role that public finance can play in terms of setting signals for wider investment and steering all forms of, of, of capital in pursuit of, of climate compatible development. And arguably, public finance is uniquely placed to take on some of those risks that, that private finance can't um, to, to, to send a signal that has both political as well as instrumental functions in terms of helping developing countries make the kinds of investments that they, that they need to make in, in climate compatible development. So. Okay, thanks, Mita. And just. Could you answer the question that I kind of got set? Is you know what function does finance play in actually getting an ambitious outcome on climate change in 2015? I think there's at least three levels on which it's useful to think about the role of finance in this regard. So we often start with finance as sort of a bargaining chip that's focused on, well, if as developing countries who confront many development challenges, we need to take on the additional complexities of responding to climate change alongside those challenges, then we need support in order to make sure that in doing that, we're not penalized in, in taking that, that forward. But I think in actually, and, and that's a context in which we talk about raising finance, or, or oftentimes this conversation about raising finances is, 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 ra is, is discussed. But there's another dimension here, which is that in actually using finance, we begin to demonstrate the viability and plausibility of low carbon development trajectories. In actually using finance, we begin to realize the potential for having better parts to prosperity instead of business as usual parts to prosperity. So in that way, there's both this political aspect in terms of creating an environment in which countries don't feel like acting is going to impede their ability to make economic progress, but also this ancillary aspect, which is around actually enabling the actions that get you to two degrees to begin to begin to to get to get underway, <coughs> um, and and so I, I guess I, I see it as uh, that that climate finance are having both this sort of political function in terms of being a sealant for an ambitious agreement, but a practical function in terms of helping us learn how we actually do these things well. Okay, thank you, Smita. Um, let me let me open questions to the floor and to our online audience. Um, I can see a set of hands. Let me move from right to left. Yes, gentleman here. Can you just tell us your name and? Uh, uh, we need we need a microphone. Hold on just a second. Tom Tom Levitt. Uh, just to follow up on that that last point, can you tell us um, how well the climate finance has been spent so far? You said thirty billion. How how well has it been spent? What is it achieved? Who wants to go on that? Smita? <laughs> uh, I can offer sort of a, an initial 
answer, and I'm sure others on the panel have 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 more to, more to add. I think the first thing that I'd notice is that actually 2010 was not very long ago, and so a lot of the projects that have been supported during the fast out finance period are quite new on the ground. So actually being able to answer your question, how well has it spent, is something that we will be we will be sort of learning over time as these programs un unfold. And I think there's a real commitment, particularly on the part of contributor countries, to learning from this experience and understanding what, what did we what worked well about how we spent this money and what can we learn from it in terms of, of trying of trying to do things things better so that's the first thing that I'd note in terms of what the money was spent on um, there's this is d unpacked in a great deal of, of detail in, in the report and I'm happy to share an advanced copy of the executive summary with you if you if you'd like even though we're only releasing it next week um, but you know just to give you some headline figures on this um, the majority of finance did support mitigation activities even though adaptation increased but from a low baseline so over seven 70% of, uh, almost 80% of finance, in fact, um, still supported um, mitigation actions. Um, about 40% uh, of the funding was provided in the form of grants and grant-like instruments. Um, the remainder was provided in the form of loans, um, some of which were non-concessional. Um, the largest recipient region for this funding was Asia, um, which is understandable because that's home to the fastest growing economies in the world and therefore where mitigation opportunities are, are, are arguably most, most evident. Um, Africa and uh, small island developing states and LDC got a large share of the adaptation funding, however, and they were really prioritized in that in that part of, of, of the spend. Um, about 30% of funding went directly to governments through intermediary, but the rest was spent through intermediaries, so through multilateral climate funds or through development institutions that will then sort of work in partnership with countries to, to take it to take it forward. So those are some snapshots in terms of, of how that money was 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 spent um, with the caveat that we'll have to learn and see what it what it's achieved. But there's undoubtedly sort of examples that our, our panel can share about ways they've seen some of this in action. Do others want to come in on that, Emily? Yeah, just to reinforce the point that Smita made, it really um, is relatively early days in terms of understanding the outcomes of uh, how that climate finance was spent. I think we can identify a number of outputs but uh, as we know, particularly when we're talking about transformational change, uh, it's really about outcomes that will be sustained over the medium and longer term that, r that really count. And it's it is probably too early to really conclude uh, in most cases. Uh, just um, as a sort of uh, anecdote, if you like, I, I was involved in um, programming the climate investment funds when I was at the IDB. and. Uh, one of the objectives there uh, was to use climate finance, uh, use public finance to uh, pilot, uh, prototype different approaches at the technology level in terms of, for example, uh, trying to accelerate uh, commercialization of uh, concentrated solar pow power, for example, or at the sectoral level, uh, I worked on the Mexican Renewable Energy Program and our objective there was to transform the, the renewable energy sector for Mexico, or at the institutional level, and I think the pilot program on climate resilience has focused very much on strengthening institu institutional arrangements and capacity for programming climate finance that will enable resilience over the short, medium and critically longer term. I, I I think we there are some interesting lessons to be drawn out, and Smita and I are working on a paper at the moment um, with respect to the Clean Technology Fund. Uh, but I think there are, you know, in the next year really, that's the time when a lot of these projects and programs uh, should really be sharing uh, the lessons that are being developed should be shared uh, more widely uh, with the international community, in particular for those that are considering the Green Climate Fund and design of the, f the sort of future international financial architecture for climate finance. And so, I, you know, as, as Smita said, it's early days to assess the outcomes, but I think um, now's really the time to be ensuring that we do capture lessons and ensure those lessons are translated into um, sort of user-friendly, understandable um, uh, learning for those that are now uh, designing the future art architecture. As, as, you, as you know, there is a lot of discussion about transformational change, and we, 
kind of know what that means. Um, I like to think about it in terms of phones, right? Like <laughs> I remember those old phones that look like a brick, and then you see what we have now, and you do think there, there was transformational change in how we communicate. So <coughs> in the context of climate, unfortunately, we don't really know what that means yet, and therefore coming to terms with what uh, countries do in practice and whether th what they do is transformative or not is, is very important. So what I wanted to say in the context of faster finance is that the initiative uh, that Germany and, and the UK um, started together, the it's called, it has a boring name, which is the NAMA facility. But basically at the core of the, <laughs> it is a bit boring, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but at the, at the core of, of, of the, 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 the vision of this, this initial uh, facility is to try to get countries to, to argue the case for why uh, what they are doing is transformative. And, and they will, I mean, if you, if you go through the list of requirements, um, we could get into a three hour discussion whether those are the right boxes that, that you would have to go through. But my, my point is that there is a more explicit approach to transformational change now than uh, what you saw in the context of the clean development mechanism. Because mm -hmm. back then, you just had to create some credits and you had to sell them and that was it. Whether they were transformative or conducive to development, let alone beneficial to communities, it, you know, that wasn't really the main driver. The main driver was to lower the cost of compliance in Europe, basically. Um, but I think nowadays we see more explicit um, efforts to say, this is business as usual and this is something that will get us to scale. And, and of course, I'm not suggesting that we are there yet, but that is one of the, the innovative mechanisms that I've seen. Um, but then we can get into a discussion whether, uh, we, whether faster finance is actually getting attention in the context of the, ac the finance discussions that we're having at home. Mm. My, my answer would be no. Okay. Can I say something really quickly? Mm -hmm. Really quickly. Yes. Um, I just wanted to, to say around this question of fast start finance, one of the biggest issues I think is transparency, and John mm -hmm. Vidal mentioned this question of transparency of the negotiations altogether. Um, I think mm -hmm. ODI is doing a lot of work to increase the transparency around climate finance, ODI mm -hmm. and other partners. And um, I think this is the big question because you can't get effective an, an assessment mm -hmm. of effectiveness if you don't have information on what's been spent and how mm -hmm. it's been spent. And this is exactly mm -hmm. the same point with subsidies, and we need a lot more transparency around these subsidies as well. And in a way, mm. one thing I think that can support this transformation is a sort of big data revolution where you're getting mm. a lot more of this information out in the public domain where you're able to kind of have sort of live assessments of, of, tra of transition and, and, and of impact. Okay, let me let me move on. Let me take a, a kind of a group of questions now. I see at one hand here, then Laurie, then online, and then Malcolm, did you want to? No? I, th I, saw, I saw your hand. Yeah. So there's a lady here. And then Laurie, then we have one online, and then let's see what time we've got. Hello, yeah. it's Desiree. Um, mm. Sunita, the question for you, how could um, adaptation finance be designed as opposed to mitigation finance to attract private uh, investments? Okay, thank you, let's hold, hold with that. And Laurie? Tom, you had talked about loss and damage mm. coming up. I'm curious how these sorts of lessons and the patterns you're seeing in climate finance what that means looking <laughs> forward to loss and damage, which is potentially much, much bigger and, and much more politically yeah. sensitive. Do you, do you get a sense of how that might begin to play out? Okay, very good, thank you. And then we have one online from um, Jan Kellett. Um, what's the role of tradition and traditional odor in pushing forward this agenda? Uh, and then let we'll go. F we'll try and go for another round before the end. Let me quickly go to um, Smita. There was one directed at you. Um, how can adaptation finance be designed uh, in such a way as to kind of crowd in? Yeah. Sure. Um, and this is a question that much better minds than mine have put an awful lot of energy um, into. So, so I apologize in, in advance for the incomplete nature of, of my answer, um, and others on this panel uh, think as, as deeply as I do on these questions and may have additional insights. Um, but certainly, the private sector is adapting all the time, 
right? Um, and a lot of the finance that we're spending on adaptation in indirect ways is enabling private actors to 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 adapt. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, and I think I do think part of the challenge here is, is is somewhat definitional in the sense that it's much easier to identify precisely when you're supporting a mitigation related um, activity than when you're supporting an activity that is adaptation related. Um, and, and a lot of sort of counting mitigation comes down to the mi private mitigation finance is linked to the ease of identifying what is, what is mitigation finance. So that's sort of you know, a, a higher a hi sort of definitional issue that doesn't actually answer your question, um, which is around how do, we, how do we get the private sector on board. Um, and I think there have been a, a number of initiatives that have looked at trying to engage the insurance sector in particular mm -hmm. um, around these sorts of questions. Again, sort of the extent to which those have been able to make, make, make progress, I think, varies widely o depending on the context in which you're trying to, to get them to engage and the sorts of interventions you're, you're trying to, to help them to do. There's an awful lot of work now getting underway, particularly with the support of multilateral climate funds aimed at, sort at looking at whether you can support agribusiness in particular um, to make investments that will help them manage long-term risk related to climate change. So that's been a major focus of the pilot program on climate resilience um, in Zambia, for example, um, during the Fast Art Finance period, trying to see if you can also work with um, those who are involved in, in agribusiness related processing to, to help them make some of these investments that and bring, bring those sort of forward so that they can, they can manage, manage resilience. Um, so, so that's you know, just, just a, a, a partial and, and inadequate, I'm sure, answer to the question of how we, how we deal with, with that challenge. Tom, do you want me to take the question on, on ODA now, or do you want to come? I'll come back to you in a moment. Let's, okay. let's deal with this. Yeah. Can we move on to loss and damage? Okay. Do you want to talk sure. loss and damage okay. as well, Emily? I will talk loss and damage. <laughs> I just wanted to add a little bit on the adaptation side to what Sweeney said. I think um, what we see is the particularly the large you know, multinational private sector companies, they are very aware of climate risks and they are adapting and incorporating those into their business models. I think where the challenge and the problems will lie are in small and medium-sized enterprises in all countries, particularly in developing countries, that don't have access to the kind of information or uh, ability to process that information about climate risks. And for them, there is a real need to uh, increase uh, information tools uh, and capacity so that they can integrate that into <coughs> their business models, if you like. Um, so, you know, and I, I see that in many countries that you know, where the big companies are doing well, the others are just not aware. In terms of loss and damage, it's I mean, I think it's a really interesting issue uh, because ultimately it's saying, well, you know, if, if the mitigation we need isn't going to happen, then be prepared to, to foot the bill for uh, what will be um, potentially um, you know, sort of life-threatening consequences in many cases. Uh, for the countries that have been most vocal on that, the least developed countries, um, particularly the Pacific Island countries. For them, it is an existential crisis. Climate change is threatening the, um, their, their livelihoods, and many of those islands already have uh, in place uh, agreements with Australia or New Zealand to relocate. But how do you really assess uh, the economic uh, impacts uh, of displacement such as that? So um, I, I, I think the loss and damage discussions uh, in Doha probably surprised a lot of uh, people, I think, by the um, uh, attention they received. I personally was not surprised because it's been an issue that, in fact, I negotiated it for the EU <coughs> back in sort of 2004 or 5. This issue has been bubbling along. Um, it had uh, it sort of finally had got uh, gained traction within the negotiations um, and did take people by surprise. I don't think it should have done, though. I think also uh, I'd just like to relate it a little bit back to what might we, you know, what what do we expect from Warsaw? And it seems to me there are sort of two main issues when we think about mitigation. There's the mitigation, the process by which countries will come together with their mitigation pledges or commitments uh, for beyond 2020, and then there's the mitigation gap between 2015 and 2020. And I think that issue is, uh, for many, particularly many of the countries who are most concerned about loss and damage, actually, where they are very, very concerned. Because if we don't really address 
the mitigation that needs to happen from 2015 onwards, then the whole loss and damage issue becomes much, much greater and much more significant from 2020 onwards. So I think we need to think about loss and damage in the context of the level of ambition around mitigation uh, and recognise the two are intrinsically linked. Let me, let me just, let me, let me just, before you talk, Monica, I'm, you know, my, I had about, um, it's probably a private conversation, but let, let me go ahead and tell the story that mm -hmm. um, a, a colleague from a, a, a country close to yours in Central America came to me about two years ago and said, look, we've, we've seen rainfall that's mm -hmm. off the scale in mm -hmm. this country. We've seen massive damage to our agricultural crops. Mm -hmm. um, it's likely to translate into being between, you know, four and six percent of GDP. Uh, we're pretty sure this is down to climate change because we've never seen anything before like this. Who do we go to? Who do we go to to ask for, for money? I, I wondered whether you, you got a sense from your you know, discussions in, in with other people in Central America about whether there's an answer to that. Mm -hmm. I think the, the main surprising moment I had when I was a negotiator was that we're, we're not supposed to ask for adaptation money. And it took me, it took me a lot of hours to figure out why why was it that it was politically incorrect for a Central American country to say we're vulnerable and we will need to access funds. And and, and the point is that um, for some reason, and, and we don't need to get into all the details, it was decided that the most vulnerable countries were islands and least developed countries. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of um, black and white thinking around that and it was a mistake but once something sets a precedent it becomes very difficult in, in the context of the UNF the UNFCCC <coughs> to change that so what has happened in practice is that adaptation concerns are so high right now in Latin America and in the Caribbean that basically countries are even willing to go to development banks and 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 in some cases ask for loans, in other cases I ask for uh, partnership with the private sector. Um, there is something called ProAdapt nowadays, it's an initiative by the Multilateral Investment Fund and the Nordic Development Fund and basically it's trying to reach out to 2,000 uh, tiny, or not tiny but you know small medium enterprises and the idea is to, s to start saying, well, we're vulnerable, we just have to deal with it, and these are a core set of practices and a core set of new ways of approaching this. So I think my answer is that there is a sense of, <laughs> I don't want to sound too tragic, but there is a sense of loneliness that we just, are have to, we just have to deal with it because basically you come to Europe and in, in the context of the negotiations, Europe will tell you, I'm so sorry, but Latin America doesn't count as the most vulnerable region in the world, <coughs> so we can't help you, s let alone the US or Canada. So, <coughs> um, so I think the benefit of, of being in this situation, in my view, is that when you come to that point, I think there, there is room for innovation because people are seriously worried, uh, in both in the private sector. Uh, just to give you a sense of how much we are spending right now in Costa Rica, the, the fund for natural disasters has about $100 million, and that is the equivalent of the market for makeup for eyebrows in the US, <laughs> just to <laughs> give you a sense of how little it is. And, and, and basically, the government right now is saying, if we have a big tragedy you know, related to, to weather, um, wh what do we do, exactly mm. your point? And then, in the end, it turned to, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank can deal with insurance yeah. and in some cases very expensive insurance. Yeah. Okay, let me just, uh, Smita, on this point about ODA, what role has ODA got to play? Let's finish with this one and then we've got a little video to show before the end. Okay. Like a school class, you know. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So the question was, um, what is the role of traditional ODA in advancing this agenda? Well, I think there's at least two levels on which I'd answer this question. So the first is by looking backwards in order to kind of then hypothesize what's going to happen going forward. So if you look backwards, um, 
almost 80% of FOSDOT finance was also counted as official development assistance. Um, so there's been a very close relationship between development assistance spending and, and climate finance up until this point, which makes a great deal of sense because many interventions that help you address climate change are also helping you address those in the context of development. Um, and we did some analysis that looked at the implications of a reliance on ODA budgets for climate-related spending and actually found that, at least during the fast art finance period, this hadn't really changed allocations of development assistance in any um, appreciable way. In fact, um, the distribution of climate finance and the distribution of development finance at present are largely similar. But that reflects the fact that development finance currently doesn't necessarily target only poor countries or only poverty-related um, interventions. And in many countries, there is a strong focus on trying to have ODA be more targeted on poverty-related interventions. Um, that's certainly a dynamic underway in the UK as, as we speak. Now, if, if ODA becomes more poverty focus, then there may be a bigger tension potentially between reliance on development assistance for climate related spending and continuing to provide much needed um, support for mitigation related activities in fast growing emerging economies. And so sort of looking down the pike, there may be um, greater tensions that, that manifest them, themselves in this agenda, which, which raises some important questions, I think, with regards to do we need a greater diversity of, of sources of, of finance that we draw in in terms of meeting the long-term um, finance agenda. That's a difficult thing to talk about in times of austerity, but as Sheila's analysis has pointed out, we seem to have money to spend on perhaps not the right things, um, so perhaps there are ways in which we could actually free up some resource to think more creatively around, around this, this possibility space. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to note before we end on this is that you know the, the reality that we have now is that continued investment in development without climate change as a, as a consideration is, is, is not a very appealing option either. So we certainly have to find ways to deal with climate change as part of development assistance support regardless of whether that is the continued source through which we primarily fund climate related activities or, or not. Um, having or development assistance budgets fund climate incompatible development would seem like a very foolish undertaking. So, Okay, thank you, Samita. And I do realise, and very sorry to those who, who do want to ask questions and want to jump in, including online, but you know, I think the panel will <coughs> stay around for a little bit, so please do come forward and ask questions of the panel uh, uh, after, the, after we close. But um, I think it would be really wrong of me to close without showing a very very brief video uh, about our, our subsidies work. And Sheila, maybe you could give it a couple of words of introduction. Um, I think, I mean, Kevin's not here anymore. I think he gave a pretty good introduction um, at the start of this talk, which is just that we wanted to find a sort of easily accessible way of talking about fossil fuel subsidies in the context of climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've put together a whole suite of different um, publications. Mm -hmm. We have the executive summary, which is on your seats. We have a report. Um, we have a number of infographics, um, we have the, the game itself, and then we have a video. So we're hoping that this will help sort of get the message um, to a wide, wide variety of audiences and, um, and keep the conversation going about subsidies. Thank you. Did you know that over half a trillion dollars is spent on subsidizing fossil fuels every year? A new report by the Overseas Development Institute shows how the rules of the game are biased in favour of dirty energy. Here's a game to help you find out more. To start, pick a number. Can I start with two? OK, two. Did you know that for every six dollars spent on fossil fuel subsidies in 2011, just one dollar went to support clean, green, renewable energy? <coughs> wow, can't believe that. Can I go for number one next? One? Um, yeah. If we stop fossil fuel subsidies to consumers by 2020, we could cut greenhouse gases by 360 million tonnes. That's the equivalent to the annual emissions of France. Pick again. I'll have number six this time. Six. Social costs. This is a surprising one. Some governments spend more on fossil fuel subsidies than on basic services. Venezuela, Pakistan and Indonesia, for example, spent at least twice as much on these subsidies than on public health. Right, pick another number. Um, I'll go for number three. Three, carbon price. This one's important. 
a high price on carbon could deter the dirtiest forms of production. Unfortunately, today's carbon price is low, falling and rarely applied. So, those are some of the facts. But how can we change the game? Fossil fuel subsidies need urgent attention. The G20 countries can take the lead if they phase out these subsidies by 2020 and support other countries to follow suit by 2025. Learn more facts about subsidies and how to make this change a reality. Read our report and share the game now at odi.org forward slash subsidies change the game.